Let's go tonight. This has been a fun series for me. The Hay Hapax Legomena. These are the one and dones. I'm calling this one and done. It's because they're heard one time. That's what the, what the phrase literally means in the Greek. Words heard once in the Greek. Now, tonight's word um, is a word that is a hapax, a true hapax, in that it's never used again in the New Testament. But it's a little deceiving of a hapax because if you saw this word in the English, uh, when you see this word in the English, you'll, you'll, you'll know that this story occurs in four Gospels. All four Gospels tell this story. And all four Gospels use some derivative of this word. But John's Gospel, which is where we'll derive it, uses it in a unique fashion. Now, I say all of that just to let you know that tonight is not really about the Hapax. This, once again, is the Hapax as a vehicle to say something else. Um, it's not really about the Hapax tonight. It's, it's there. It gives me, it gives me a, a center pole to, to build this thing around. But what, what is the centerpiece tonight? Is the story of the cleansing of the temple. And part of the reason for that is because in the lectionary reading, I've been preaching as, as closely as I can, the, the, the Christian lectionary on Sundays in our church. And this next Sunday, the reading is from John 2, where Jesus goes into the temple and he cleanses the temple. And, he, and then he says, tear the temple down three days, I'll rebuild it. And so I've had that on my mind. I've been thinking about that because I know I'm preaching that this weekend. And to me, that is a powerful story. There's about... 20 things to say, that, and all, the, all of them are relevant. And so I can't say 20 of them in a sermon. So I'm going to do a lesson tonight on the teaching, on the cleansing of the temple, and then a sermon on it on Sunday. And so these will these sort of go together, but there's so much to say that they stand on their own as far as I'm concerned. Tonight's title is No Trades Allowed. I want you to think about this phrase. You don't know what this means yet, but you do know we're talking about the cleansing of the temple, so you can probably put two and two together. But I want you to think about this in terms of buying and selling, uh, in terms of exchange, in terms of merchandise, in terms of business, okay? And consider the fact that Jesus is going to go in and cleanse the temple, and what might this mean in correlation to that? Before we read any text, let's give you the Hapax. Because it's not, again, this isn't built around the Hapax, but, but here it is. It's money changers. It's the Greek word kermatistis. Now, that's truly a hapax. Nowhere else is that word used exactly that way. But that word is actually from a family of words related to a number of words that have to do with words like fragment or breaking into smaller pieces. And it feels like the translators took the phrase money changer, or the English translators put the words money changer in there because the synoptic gospels mention some form of this, exchange rate or changers of money. And so they don't all use the same word, but they're using the same thought. So in essence, even though John does pick a unique Greek word to, for money changers, they're all rotating around this idea of a group of people who exchange coinage in the temple, in the Gentile court of the temple, uh, so that people can purchase goods and services, namely sacrificial animals. We're going to get into all of that tonight. We're using that as just a way to get us to something bigger. Let's read the story itself from John chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Watch the details of this, and I know we've taught John, but we're going to do some stuff tonight as if I didn't go back and listen to what we did in John 2 with the temple. I don't do that. Usually I try to be fresh. So let's just see what we see as we read this story. Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. There's your hapax. This word never used in quite the same way again in the Greek. And uh, we'll, we'll get to what that might mean because that's, that's going to help us to interpret the rest of that verse. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Famous story. This is, the, this is the most violent we ever see Jesus in the Gospels. He makes a whip. He overturns tables. Stuff's flying everywhere. He drives out most of the Gospels, all of the Gospels, in one way or the other, have Jesus driving these people out of the temple. Matthew, Mark, and Luke pitch it in a much more angry tone. Um, in fact, one of them, I think maybe Luke, even stares down 
the people and won't let them come back in. He's, he's a, he's, there's a rage in his eyes in the Synoptic Gospels. But John pitches, pitches this a little differently. John doesn't have Jesus as violent. Yes, he makes a whip, but he doesn't hit people. He knocks over tables and he stops the business as it's happening. Um, that's only one of the unique things. I, I know that when we studied John, we talked about what makes him non-synoptic, non-similar, because the fact that we call John a non-synoptic gospel means that at every turn we're going to be saying, John does this different, John does this different, John does this different. Well, that's obvious, and I don't want to repeat all of those, but if, in case you don't know, what makes John unique is that John isn't giving a biography of Jesus. Um, he doesn't bother with his birth. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't bother with his growing up. He just, in fact, he doesn't even bother to give a traditional opening. He, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, John reimagines Genesis, and he starts all over again with a new man. And in some ways, and this doesn't take much of the stretch of the imagination. In fact, it's kind of fun to do this. If you, if you will do it, I think that John is writing the story of Jesus from the view of the resurrection. I think he's showing you a glorified Jesus. He's showing you a Jesus who moves about as if he's glorified. And he's not telling the story as if... He, he's telling the story of Jesus before the cross, but he's telling it through the lens of someone who knows about the resurrection. And it's why Jesus doesn't talk about certain things. And it's why he moves in a certain way. And it's why he acts a certain way. And it's why his speeches are dripping with the Holy Spirit and with the lack of condemnation. The Jesus is presented in John is different. So that's no stretch then of the imagination to think that the cleansing of the temple is different. So there's a few unique things about it. And I want to look at these because I think it will help us to get to the bottom of what I want to do tonight. Uh, unique aspects of John's version of cleansing the temple. And I'm just going to do three. There's I, actually, I just did one right there that it doesn't seem as angry. Um, he doesn't, he definitely doesn't hit any individuals. We can't prove that he hits anyone in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but certainly in John's version, he doesn't. That's one, but I want to show you three other ones. First, John places the event at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The Synoptic Gospels place the event at the end of Jesus' ministry. I do know that when we taught this a few years ago in this room, when we got to John 2, I would have said something like this, that... Maybe it's evidence that happened twice. Maybe Jesus cleanses the temple early in his ministry. And then maybe on his way to the cross, he does it again. And I hold that as a possibility, but not as much as I used to. And the reason that I don't hold it that, as much as I used to is one of the things that has developed in me more since we did John is this conviction that John is trying to tell the story entirely different than it's ever been told before. And he moves things out of order on purpose so that he can tell the story the way he wants to. So for purposes of tonight's lesson, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm going to make an assumption. I'm saying this up front. And that assumption is that John places the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry for a distinct purpose. Not so that we will think he did it at the beginning of his ministry, but so that we will pay attention to something John is trying to say. And that will say, have, have a, 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 greater, a greater purpose. Number two, John separates the event of the cleansing of the temple from the healings and from other miracles. He makes the cleansing of the temple the primary reason Jesus is here. John's unique in this. The other synoptics have Jesus healing the sick while he's there. Casting out devils, they have Jesus performing miracles. People are coming to Jesus while he's at the Temple Mount. His ministry sort of continues. It's almost as if, in, in a lot of the other Gospels, it's almost as if Jesus is doing ministry, moving through, gets to the Temple, has this incident, knocks some tables over. The crowds are with him. He's healing the sick. It's just part of what he's doing. John separates all of that. John goes, okay, forget this. I want to show you this picture with just Jesus. This is going to be a unique way of showing this. No healings, no miracles. In fact, listen to the conversation that's going to be ca carried on. And that leads me to number three, and maybe to me the most important one. John's version of this story contains a conversation. And that conversation puts this event, event inside of a greater conversation about signs. 
And that, to me, is why John puts it up front. Because John has a message he's trying to deliver. And we don't catch these messages. These are difficult. I'm, I'm, I'll be honest. We, these are difficult because we read the Bible in snippets. We have to. We don't have time every day to read the entire Gospel of John. Most of the time. Or we don't create the time. And, okay. And I'm not condemning us. I'm, this, is, this is life. Um, and we're... Relative to the history of the world, we're some of the first generations of people that had this chance anyway. So it's, you know, how, how can we be condemned for not doing the thing that we, that nobody in front of us could ever do? Okay, so I'm not saying we ought to read it all all the time. However, because we read it in snippets, we miss flow. You know, like we miss this connects to this connects to this. So Bible study affords you the chance to go back in and look at the things you miss and highlight them in a way that makes them make sense in ways that they don't if you read a chapter today and a chapter tomorrow and a chapter the next day. Okay, so I'll do it for you. Think about that third one. That third one is John's version of the cleansing of the temple contains a conversation. People talking back and forth, that's conversation. People talk back and forth. They talk to Jesus, Jesus talks back to them. Okay, that's a conversation. It contains a back and forth conversation that puts the event inside of a greater conversation that John's trying to tell through the lips of Jesus, through the actions of Jesus, and through the questions of Jesus' as disciples and detractors. Okay, you're in John 2. What's the most famous event in John 2? Turn the water wine. Okay, I say most famous because probably... If you were to ask unchurched people, have you ever heard of the time Jesus cleansed the temple? A lot of them would say, no, I don't know what that means. But if you would have said, have you ever heard that Jesus turned the water to wine? That one's like in the zeitgeist of our, that, people know about that. It's, it's even a phrase that we use about Jesus or about water or about wine. Um, it's the punchline to a joke. It's the most famous moment in John 2. And most of us came up hearing that turning the water to the wine was the first miracle. And the reason we heard it was the first miracle is because some translations use the word miracle. They say this was the beginning of miracles that Jesus did when he was in Cana. But John chapter 2, verse 11, which tells you about that, actually says this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed him. And this is an important word for John because he's telling you up front, I'm going to give you a bunch of signs. I'm telling you stories that are signifying bigger things. This is the beginning of signs. Jesus wasn't just doing things. Jesus was doing things that meant something bigger. And by the way, if, if you are of the persuasion that the gospel of John is written by the same guy that writes Revelation, and it might very well be. How does he open the book of Revelation? He tells you these are the things that signify. These are signs of the one who's to come. So he's just using the same language to tell you that the stories of Revelation are signs of something bigger. So right out of the gate, John 2 tells you that the water to wine, this is water to wine, by the way, that the water to wine was the beginning of signs. Okay, after that, you go into Jerusalem. Here comes, you go, if you're reading, you're reading your columns of your Bible, okay? Water to wine, Jesus goes into Cana, cleanses the temple. And at the cleansing of the temple, he gets questioned right after he knocks the tables over. And the question is in John 2.18, the Jews answer and say to Jesus, what sign do you show us since you do these things? That's a little bit clunky. It's a little more like this in the Greek. What does this stuff mean? You're doing this. What's it, what's it signify? It's got to mean something. Now, I want to give kudos right here to this, these unnamed Jews. Kudos. They got it. This guy's just not knocking over tables. This means something, right? What's the sign? What are you trying to tell us? Because he doesn't preach a sermon. He does say, you know, don't make my father's house a place of merchandise. And zeal hath swallowed him up for his house, the disciples say. But what does this mean? Now, this is John writing, right? John's the one telling these stories. Water, wine, first sign. 
Cleanse the temple? What's the sign? What's the next chapter? Chapter 3, which contains the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever... Okay, what's that verse fall in the middle of? A conversation at night between Nicodemus and Jesus. And how does Nicodemus introduce himself? What does he say first and foremost? John chapter 3, verse 2, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God because no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Water to wine, first sign. Temple being cleared, what's the sign? Nicodemus, very next story, John 3. Nobody could be from God unless he was doing the signs you're doing. See, you don't catch it if you read John 1 one day, John 2 the next day, John 3 the next day. If you read them all back to back and you watch for that word, you get it three times. Sign, sign, sign. Here's your sign. What's the sign? These signs must mean you're from God. Okay? Uh, shelve that for a little bit. Just put it on the shelf because the truth is, is that once we answer what the sign is, the lesson's over. Okay? Because that's the point. And Jesus doesn't even tell them what the sign is. Because if he tells them what the sign is, the lesson's over. Which tells us that a lot of times we're not really supposed to get the answer. We're just supposed to keep asking the question. Because if we keep asking the question, we'll keep wrestling with what it might be and what it might not be. We'll have to filter through stuff. And a lot of times I get frustrated with Jesus in the Gospels. They ask him a question, Jesus doesn't answer. Instead, he just asks them a question back. Or he says something like that. You know, something about signs. And you go, why don't you just give it to us? And so it's a part of the greater story. And as we dig in, hopefully it becomes a little clearer. So before we determine what Jesus is doing, <laughs> let's make sure we understand what he's not doing. Because I do actually think that this is how you wrestle. Do you not have to get to the bottom of the answer? Sometimes just get rid of some stuff. Shed the baggage. Just trim the fat. Like maybe if you're going to get down to it, you need to get rid of the stuff that's the forest, you know, the whole forest for the trees argument. So you need to move some stuff out of the way so that you can figure it out. So what, let's, let me say it this way. Why is Jesus so angry? What is it that's ticked him off so badly that he fashions a whip? This is out of character. You got to think this is out of character. He doesn't do it again. He's not, he's not a violent man. He's not going after people here, by the way. He's not breaking legs and shedding blood. But he is knocking over tables, which tells me that sometimes tables need knocked over. Um, sometimes people got to knock stuff over. And I'll be honest, I'm not smart enough to know when tables need knocked over. Um, so I think we should probably just let Jesus do the table knocking because we're, we're going to do, probably do a poor job of knocking tables over. But sometimes tables have to be knocked over. And even in society, people take enough and they get violent. And violence against other people doesn't ever seem to have a justification. Violence against systems. Violence against roadblocks. Violence against tables tables maybe is to be expected and maybe it's to be expected because jesus did it maybe that's part of what this story tells us why is he so angry well let's figure out why he's not okay that's a good place to start number one this is taking place in the court of the gentiles thus the rules are a bit looser so we're not seeing jesus angry at a lack of quote-unquote holiness we're not in the temple proper we're on the Temple Mount, and on the Temple Mount, on the outside, is the courtyard of the Gentiles. And so not everyone at this point on the Temple Mount is a Jew. They're not all there to actually do anything in the temple that would be considered worship. It's a thoroughfare. You could go from one side of the Temple Mount to the other side of the Temple Mount through the court of the Gentiles. You're literally allowed through this, and you have no heritage that brings you to the temple for worship. And so because of that, it's looser in that there are not strict rules. There are some. Don't, don't get me wrong. There are, there are rules to this day on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But there are not the rules that would be in place, say, inside of the temple proper, the holy place, or the most certainly the most holy place, or even the court of women, which was a whole different court than the court of the Jewish men. 
So because we're in the Gentile court, you can't say it's because Jesus looks around and they're not doing it Levitically. Like he knows Torah. He goes, you guys are messing this up. This isn't the way the Torah is. So get it out of your mind that Jesus turns over tables because we're not holy enough. You can get rid of that one because it can't be the case. Because there is not a Jew alive in that day that would have demanded holiness from a Gentile. They wouldn't have assumed a Gentile knew anything about holiness. Gentiles were sinners. So he's in the middle of a court of sinners. So he's not coming in here mad everybody's sinning. And if he is, he should probably make that known. So get rid of the first one. And by the way, that's the lowest hanging fruit. That's the one everybody can scream and yell about every time they get up and preach is that people ain't living right. People aren't living right. We need to demand a higher form of living, higher morality. We need more holiness. And so get rid of the table flipping version of Jesus who flips them because of the lack of holiness. Here's what else we know he's not doing. The buying and the selling of animals was a matter of convenience. Remember, he comes in at Passover. There's probably a million, historians say probably upwards of a million people would make the journey to Jerusalem that did not live there during Passover. That number doesn't seem as big to us in a world of seven and a half billion people. That, world was astro- that number is astronomical in the first century. Astronomical. You can't even move in Jerusalem with a million strangers, pilgrims coming into Jerusalem. Because of the journey, people don't bring sacrificial animals with them on their pilgrimage. they got to offer up sacrifices for Passover, maybe for themselves, for their house, for their children, for their marriage. They're not going to bring that. That's difficult. Some of them are traversing days, weeks to get to Jerusalem for Passover. And you didn't always go because you couldn't afford to always go. But when you went, you were going to offer up a sacrifice. And so because they didn't have them with them, They would buy and sell animals in the court or at the gates. And that was common practice. So it's not business that's got Jesus mad. Because they've been doing this forever. This is to be expected. In fact, there's Torah sanction for buying bulls, goats, sheep, pigeons, and turtle doves. The Torah even gives financial listings of which ones you are to give based upon your income. So if you're wealthy, then you bring a bull. And if you're a little less wealthy, you bring a goat, and then a sheep, and then a pigeon, and then a turtle dove, on down the line. So he's not mad about business. He's not mad because kids are selling candy bars in a church foyer. You know, he's not... He's not losing his mind because the youth group selling t-shirts so they can go to Six Flags. And Jesus, boy, if he was here, he'd, he'd be kicking these off. This is the stuff I heard, you know, coming up. You know, about getting all fired up because some kid comes in with a, you know, a magazine listing going, you guys like to buy magazines? And then somebody lose their mind because the kid did that in the sanctuary. And this place is too holy to buy, you know, Time magazine. So he's not mad because they're doing business. He expects them to do business. They're in the place to do business. That's not the problem. Here's something else. Money exchange. Money exchange is necessary because you couldn't bring an image into the temple. This This is the biggest rule they have in Judaism is don't make into yourselves a false image, a graven image. And so they couldn't bring any image into the temple. And the problem is Roman coins were stamped with the image of Caesar. So if you came into the Temple Mount with Roman money, you had handfuls of Little Caesar's faces. Little Caesar's pizza? No, Little Caesar's coins. You got Little Caesar coins. Which is also a little ancillary sidebar here. When somebody asked Jesus about paying taxes, and Jesus says, give me a coin. And somebody flips him a coin. He catches it and goes, whose face is this? And they say, well, that's Caesar. And in Jesus' day, it would have been, Caesar Augustus would have been an older coin. Later in his life, it would have been Caesar Tiberius, second emperor, and then the third emperor. So we don't know. It's one or the other. But Caesar would mark the coinage of the empire with his face, with the title, Son of God. 
And so Jesus, the Son of God, is holding a coin with the face of the empirical Son of God on it. And Jesus says, whose face is this? And they say, well, that's Caesar's. And Jesus looks at it and says, well, then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Because in the Jewish mindset, there is no image of a God. So he can't be a God because you can't make an image of a God. So by putting Son of God, he's disqualifying himself to even be a God. And so Jesus goes, well, then you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But give to God what belongs to God because who's the image of God? God said, let us make man in our image. And so man is made in the image of God. And so what Jesus is saying is give to Caesar whatever belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. Guess what belongs to God? You do. So give yourself to God. Give your money to Caesar. But don't give yourself to money. And don't give yourself to Caesar. It's good stuff there. We'll leave that. Wrestle on that. Dwell on that. Think about that. So you can't take... You can't take little Caesars into the temple. So you have to exchange it. So they would exchange Roman coinage for temple coin. The temple printed its own coin. They minted their own coin. And we have every reason to believe that the exchange rates got out of hand pretty quick. And so temple coin for Roman coin was no doubt ripping people off right and left. But the whole action of it can't be why Jesus is mad. They have to do it. They have to exchange the money. Otherwise, they're bringing images into the temple. So he isn't angry at the exchange. Maybe he's angry at the exchange rate, and I think that's worth exploring. Not tonight. But it's not the process by which money changes hands that has Jesus all fired up. Let's just listen to Jesus. Listen to the, he only says one thing while he's tearing the tables down. It's John 2, 16. He said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, this has caused some to think that he says it to the tables of doves because the doves are the poorest. And so Jesus is mad that they're stealing money from poor people. But again, Torah has demands that the poor also bring a dove. So they have to have opportunity. Maybe they're being ripped off. Maybe the price of doves is out of hand. Maybe the rich don't pay nearly for the bull per capita, per income, what the poor man pays for the dove. That would be classic economics of the world. Uh, that's very possible. But I don't exactly think that's what's happening. Notice the word that is used here in John 2.16. Go back. The word that is used in John 2.16, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. But you're going to notice, depending on what translation you use, that those words are all over the place. It's not just merchandise that is used. Sometimes all kinds of words are used. But here's the important thing about it that I think is relevant for us tonight. Let me show you this. Merchandise, sometimes it's called exchange, sometimes it's called market, sometimes it's called business. But they come from the Greek word emporion. And out of the Greek word emporion, we filter that word through the Latin. And out of the Latin and into Old English, we get the word emporium. Now, we think of an emporium as this big old shopping place, a big shopping mall. But here's the problem with these translations. Some of them say market, exchange, merchandise, business. The problem is there's an obvious Greek word for market. It's not here. There's an obvious Greek word for business. It's not here. What is here is a word that's better translated trade. So Jesus says, you made my father's house a house of trade. Jesus is angry for the cause, not that people have to buy sheep, not that they have to exchange their coins, not that they're not being reverent in the temple but that the entire system has taught people that the goodness of God comes through trade, that you can offer God something, and that God has an exchange rate of his own, that God will give something back to you, that you can bring God something and barter and trade with God. Because trade is essentially, I have this, 
I have this phone and you have money. And we have to get to a place where you put up the kind of money that represents this to me. Okay? And whatever that is, is between you and me. That's a free market. <laughs> so if you go, well, I've got $200. I have to decide, is two $100 bills the same to me as this? Because if it is, then it's an equal trade on my part. But if I look at that 200 and go, gosh, no, this is, it's gotta be way more than that. Then we have to barter. We have to either come up with something else or you have to convince me that your trade is worth my trade. We do this all the time. We just don't think about it. We do it every day. We go and buy gas or we buy food. We give the exchange. And if it's too much, this is why we get to the end of the meal and we look at the bill and go, I ain't coming back here. Why? Because I've already ate. And what I ate ain't worth that. Right? Well, I can't spit it all up all over the table now and not pay, but I'm not coming back because the trade rate wasn't right. The food wasn't great. The money was too much for the quality. And so we move on and we refuse to trade. We over, we'll pay more if we think we're getting something valuable. This, this entire system requires us to self-evaluate what we have and rank it, rate it. What's that worth? What's that worth? What's that worth? How much does she have versus how much she has versus how much he has versus how much he has? Who has the most to give me this? And then we, we both have to come to a medium of exchange. This is happening in real time in the temple all of the time. And none of it's ungodly. It's the court of the Gentiles. It's supposed to happen according to Torah. They got to change their money. Everything that's happening is supposed to happen. It's happening the way it's supposed to happen. And yet on this particular day, Jesus is bugged by it. He's seen it his entire life. He's probably come in there and bought a pigeon, exchanged his money. But today it has a bigger meaning because today he wants to put up a sign. I want you to consider that God and you are not equal trading partners. You don't have anything to offer the God of the universe. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough time, intelligence, beauty, wisdom. You're limited. You're going to die. Your beauty is going to fade. Your money is not going with you. He will outlast you. He was here before you. He'll be here after you. This isn't meant to make us feel small. It's meant to show us how stupid it is to think we could trade with God. What would we possibly have to exchange with the God of the universe? Even if we were to bring the very best of what we have, how could we possibly bring it in, a, in an exchange? It's why... At the basis of everything we do, we have to do it by faith. We cannot do it by merit because when we begin to do it by merit, we become Cain. Abel offers a lamb. Cain offers the fruits of his field. We've cut Cain down forever in evangelical circles. We're kind of the ones that do this, by the way. We cut Cain down because his offering didn't bleed. But it has nothing to do with blood. Hebrews says God accepted Abel because of his faith. By faith, offered, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Not by blood. The difference is not that Abel offers a good lamb. Because I heard it taught this way. Abel offers the fattest little perfect lamb he has. The best one. And Cain offers a bunch of rotten veggies that he was going to throw out. That's how this was taught. Cain offers the garbage. Like, eh, here you go, God. But the truth is, is that according to Hebrews, is that they both offer what they got. They both offer themselves, the, their, their trade value. Faith recognizes that the best you have cannot barter and trade with a good God. Therefore, faith asks God to be good based upon God being good, not based upon your offering. Works brings the best that it has. And if God don't like it, this is Cain. 
Too bad. It's the best I got. I'm a farmer. It's all I got. They both give the best they have, but only one comes knowing that the best he has could never be enough. So he throws himself at the mercy of the court. Cain's refusal to do that is the great sin of humanity. The Old Testament understood this about God. This is why we need to read the Psalms. This is why we need to pray them from time to time. Because if we will pray them, we'll get an insight into how they thought about God. Listen to this from Psalm chapter 50, verse 9. This is God talking. I'm not going to take a bull from your house. I'm not going to take goats out of your folds. Every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. In other words, what do you have? I own them all. By the way, thousand is just a big old number in Hebrew numerology for the biggest you can get. Because if it's not, then God doesn't own the cow on the 1,001st hill. Right? Come on. Cattle on a thousand hills means I got all the cows. Keep that in mind when you have a thousand year reign. Maybe it has less to do with 10 centuries and more to do with an infinite amount of time. But that's for another day. <laughs> Every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains. I know the wild beasts of the field. They're mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you because the world is mine and all its fullness. God goes, if I had a need, I wouldn't come to you because you wouldn't have anything to give me. You're a terrible trading partner. I own your stuff. Whatever you have is mine. Whatever you have in your hands, I already own. I already possess. It's all mine. I wouldn't take a bull from you. I wouldn't take a goat from you. I own all the cows. We're terrible trading partners. And because we're terrible trading partners, Jesus comes into the temple and goes, this isn't going to work. So what's the sign? Here's the best I can do. John 2, he turns your water to wine. He changes you. He increases your value. Wine's more valuable than water on the market. But he won't accept a trade because what you offer, he won't accept a trade, which is what you would offer for what he can give. No trades allowed with God. He's a giver, not a taker. No trades. Water to wine, Beginning of signs. Clears the temple. Don't make my dad's house a house of trade. What sign are you trying to show us? Nicodemus comes and goes, you must be from God to be laying down these signs. We've never seen anything like this. Jesus says you got to be born again if you're really going to get it. He wasn't inviting Nicodemus to pray the sinner's prayer. He was inviting Nicodemus to swear off his first father, Cain and step into a newness of life. He was inviting him to be born again into a new kingdom where there's no trades allowed. There's a system of the world that often makes its way into the system of the church. When the system of the world makes its way into the system of the church, the church loses. You want separation of church and state, by the way, because when they come together, the church doesn't get stronger with the power of the world. The church gets weaker immediately, devastatingly so. It, it infiltrates and bogs it down because it changes its filter. It begins to look at its value in the eyes of the systems of the world. It begins to rank its power on laws, nations, leaders, and politics, and money, possessions and buildings and size. And when it does this, it barters and trades for people's affection. We have something to offer you. Come here and offer us what you are. And I think Jesus would come through and knock our tables over again and go, my dad's house is not a house of trade. That's not, that has nothing to do with selling candy bars in the foyer. It has everything to do with selling your soul. What would it profit a man? Jesus said. If he gained the whole world, lost his own soul. Or what, listen to his next line, or what would a man give in exchange for his own soul? He goes, because you're going to be offered something. So what's it worth to you? Good news is the father isn't in the trading business. He's in the giving business. 
Jesus says to the disciples, to all of us, it is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you, <laughs> not trade, not exchange, not bring you up to where you're valuable and not give you the kingdom. He's in the process of turning you from water to wine, but it's his speed, his pacing, his thing. We don't barter and trade our way in. Now, there's more beautiful things in John 2. There's some stuff there in the temple that I'm going to dig into this weekend. But I, I wanted to get no trades allowed out there. I wanted to lay that out there so that, and I know our hay packs, money changers, is just a good way to get us into the story. Didn't really have a whole lot to do with, with trade, other than maybe the fact that John uses a unique word to be unique because he's already being unique. Um, but in any case, stop trading with God. Okay, well, what does that look like practically? Well, um, for me, sometimes it looks like if you'll do this, I'll do this. That's trading. What's this worth to you? What do you got? Uh, you got you to gotta do more. What's the anointing going to cost me, God? What's favor going to cost me? What's, what am I going to have to give in order for you to do this? God, if you'll do this, I promise you I will. No trades allowed. If you'll move right here, here's what I'll give you. Which, by the way, just opens you up to a world of condemnation. Because wherever you fail, you're just going to feel like a dog. Because you're going to feel like you didn't just lie to yourself, you lied to God. That's got to be ten times worse, right? Been there, done that. You have a God who's moved. He's not in the trade business. He's in the gift-giving business. What would you give in exchange for your soul? The answer is, you don't have enough for the value of your soul. <laughs> in the eyes of the Father, you don't have enough to give. So anything you give it up for in this system, you sold yourself short. If you'd get off the market and into the market of the kingdom, you could receive the kingdom as a gift. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let's pray. You, those of you listening and watching, and, and for all of us here, let's just take ourselves off the market, shall we? Take yourself off the meat market of f anointings and favor and get off the market. Father, thank you that we're off the market. <laughs> we don't, we're not in a barter and trade. Thank you that we serve a God who is all about giving to us his goodness. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, Father, if it's your good pleasure to give the kingdom, then, Father, we want to receive the kingdom. And you told Nicodemus the only way to get in there is be born again. In other words, we step into the death of Christ so we can step out into the resurrection of Jesus. That's all we have is ourselves. The truth is, you only ask for everything we've got. <laughs> you only ask for everything we've got. What would it cost me, Lord? Well, how much do you have? That'll do it. But when we do it another way, where we think we got to earn more, give more, do more, Father, we just insult the spirit of grace. Thank you for this revelation. Help us walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.